Well, everyone, we've got unfortunate news for uh, GOG, right? Many people like GOG. Of course, they've got a really, really nice launcher that can integrate with a whole bunch of storefronts. And, uh, you know, old games are there. The DRM stance, all these things people like. But that's actually not transferring into their bottom line. And that has meant that CD uh, project or CDP group, right? The overall uh, are having to reallocate resources away from GOG, which is certainly not going to be great news for people who really like the store. Basically, the development side had a strong enough quarter. The retail side fell over. This was covered in their earnings call. The year, or well, yeah, revenues only increased by 3%. Um, you know, they, they had lots of releases, things going on in the store. Revenue was only up 3%, um, but the GOG segment posted a net loss of 1.14 million. And in terms of um, other year-to-date figures, uh, GOG posted a net loss of 2.21 million year-to-date, which is really not good. And it's significantly down from the 1.37 million gain during the first three reporting quarters of this year. So not good. Not good money, uh, money go. Uh, now, this is not the first time the GOG has experienced difficulties. Of course, we heard that uh, basically because of the finances, about 10% of their headcount was let go around 2018. Um, and at the time, reportedly, uh, they were told it was a financial uh, decision. Basically, they were getting pretty close to being in the red. Obviously, they now are in the red. Um, and at the time, another a non-staffer and basically outed Gwent as a financial disappointment, with CDP themselves having already blamed GOG's small reach for Gwent struggling, which is uh, fairly interesting. And yeah, we'd all heard, and I think maybe noticed. Because uh, I see around that time with Gwent, like me and Thomas were going to like all the games comms and everything for, you know, just trying to hunt down a publisher uh, for Pale Beyond. And we'd always notice these like really just Gwent had such a presence, even yeah. in the business, because there's the public side of games comms, where we'd be is in the business halls, where, you know, it's kind of like more of a standard business uh, expo. And even in there, lavish Gwent installations, right? And it was just like, fucking hell, they're putting so much into Gwent. Sort of didn't really seem to go um, anywhere. Though, I mean, I don't know people who really like Gwent. Um, now, GOG um, basically having a rocky time was also why CDP hastily released the Thronebreakers expansion on Steam after first declaring it a GOG exclusive. Basically, GOG didn't end up having the reach they wanted. Yeah, I mean, Thronebreaker was such an interesting idea. Of like, hey, here's a little uh, story, little base thing you've got about Witcher, and uh, shit, no one's bought it. Well, we need to make our money back, so throw it on a platform that will actually sell it. And that's just really unfortunate for GOG in general. I think their their entire story is just misfortune after misfortune, I think. Yeah, especially when it has so many great things like the support for old games and Galaxy 2. Um, yeah. So as for what's being done about this, well, um, here's what's been said to investors. Regarding GOG, its performance does present a challenge, and we've recently taken measures to improve its financial standing. First and foremost, we've decided GOG should focus more on its core business activity, which means offering a hand-picked selection of games with its unique DRM-free philosophy. In this line of approach, there will be challenge or changes to the team structure. And that's basically the thing. They're not going to be able to compete with Steam at doing what Steam does. So instead, they need to use niche as their leverage and just do well off that niche audience. Uh, so some GOG developers will be transferred to other areas of the company. GOG will also be leaving the so-called Gwent Consortium, which is a cross-division collaboration related to Witcher spin-off titles. Of course ties back to what we said about Quent there. And the withdrawal means that it will neither bear its portion of expenses nor obtain the corresponding uh, shares of revenue associated with that project. Uh, back in 2017, CDP, uh, CDP actually identified Gwent as its most important project in the GOG segment. <laughs> so that's really how they were trying to, uh, trying to do it. And obviously times have changed. Now, they didn't give an indication of how these would affect the client facing product basically. Um, saying that alongside these changes, uh, we believe that all of the changes we're introducing will allow GOG to focus more on its core business and that that will improve its financial effectiveness. So basically, probably cutting costs, refocusing to where the profit is. I, I suppose 80-20 principling yeah. the, the segment as much as they can. So basically returning to their roots, which will probably do the platform good, though it's not exactly super forward-looking. And that's basically the thing. GOG started off with its niche of being good old games. That's when it was called Good Old Games. The whole rebrand to, you know, to GOG and the official way to pronounce it being GOG 
Uh, that was really them, you know, also sell, you know, selling the first party CDPR games, um, really expanding to be more of a smaller Steam with a slightly different philosophy. And uh, then, of course, God Galaxy, Galaxy 2, and it just seems those things have not really paid off. Um, fair play to them for actually putting the investment in and really trying, but I think it's just ended up that Steam, it's just so damn entrenched. And I think that the people likely to use GOG are probably Steam users. Yeah, I think that's the, that's like the most important key of it is the idea of they can ha- carve out their niche of DRM free old games and DRM free actual like uh, existing games, but companies aren't going to want that to happen. That is going like you're not going to get any of the massive new releases DRM free unless they are from CDP. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing where they have to learn to live alongside Steam as opposed to try to compete, which is sort of Galaxy anyway, but it certainly proved a little bit, uh, proving difficult to focus on both at once, I guess. And for another thing, like Galaxy 2 is great, but um, actually it does have a zero day vulnerability and has had for almost a year. Yeah, so the the TLDR there is there's a publicly disclosed local privilege escalation vulnerability. And the story of that is interesting because it was the finder of it contacted them as per Google's like disclosure policy and they just didn't take it seriously. Like it was after it was published, they said it would require three months to fix because it requires a major design change. So just, sorry, we can't fix this. It will take three months. But then they fell quiet, haven't fixed it yet. And I guess the problem is largely that this vulnerability is still there as of January, 2021. It's not been fixed. And the question is, will they actually be able to fix it? Then you also have to think back to the Hitman drama. Because that's kind of, when you look at like the 80-20 principle and them trying to focus on core business, something went wrong with Hitman, but clearly no employee paid enough attention to actually get Hitman to work. You know, they, they made sure it ran, but they didn't give it the attention to detail that they really should have overall. Ultimately, in the end, for that Hitman drama, they did respond correctly. So it's like, their heart's definitely in the right place. Obviously, it's like with the the vulnerability, that seems to be core functionality rushed out, overworked devs, a lot of technical debt, something they literally don't have the resources to solve because, you know, staff are going, restructuring, etc., etc. But their heart's in the right place. Their niche is good. Mm -hmm. They just need to actually focus on it properly to get it to actually, you know, happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So can they compete against Steam? Probably not. Um, I'd also say like a thing, you know, one of the rituals I do almost every day is I log on to the back end of Steam and I see what's our impressions? Mm. What's our page visits? What's our wish list number like today? Mm. And that's because of Steam. It's got a great value in, uh, you know, in that. And I, I believe... Trying to remember because I edited all of the storefront logos yeah. into the trailer when I was editing the trailer for our game. So I think we are on GOG. I think we're going to be on GOG. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like, I like him, happy for him, but it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah. you find out about games on Steam. They have the discoverability. They have uh, such a large captive audience who have all their games there. Mm. And yeah, you can use uh, Galaxy as a front end for Steam. Mm. But <sighs> what about the Steam store? better than it. people want to go and browse the steam store and have it all in one pl- and that's just the it's the challenge they've got so there's no fix to this yeah i think it really just is going to come down to kind of changing up you know who and what they are yeah. maybe it's going back to those those basics like you know with niche right mm. like even with uh with our game we're in a niche because what niche does is it hyper optimizes your marketing mm. it gets you a bunch of free marketing because anybody who likes, you know, anything, you know, the people who like Frostpunk, you know, that sort of niche, the pe- maybe the people who like The Long Dark, yeah. um, the, you know, people who uh, like the stories of like Shacklin Scott, all those things, the Heroic mm-hmm. Age of uh, Antarctic Exploration, they're going to, it's going to be very easy for our game to reach them, right? Because, you know, we're not making an FPS <laughs> in a, you know, in a setting that's going to compete with a humongous big... Yeah. It's power of niche. Even how 
I got started off. Like if, if I just decided in 2013, oh, I'm going to become the next, uh, you know, total biscuit. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just going to start posting my, my game reviews. Yeah, variety stuff. Yeah. It, or, you know, immediately go for variety. That would have been really hard. Mm. The only way I was able to grow that channel was, you know, small fish in a small pond that slowly gets a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, right? Like that's, so if I didn't have the niche of World of Warcraft to grow within, it would have been impossible to find reach and audience. So I think with GOG, it's just got to be about keeping their costs down and then working out how they can serve DRM free and old games as good as is possible and maybe try to innovate on that business model. Are yeah. there people who would be willing, I mean, take a game I like, Freelancer, can't buy it. Mm. Just go to the abandoned website and download it for free. Which probably means GOG aren't going to have much success there. But there's so many old games, you know, you've got to wonder, is there a, some initiative that they can launch with some of those games? Very challenging in terms of rights and all that shit. Um, could they launch a subscription product mm. to, you know, almost be like a Game Pass for old games? You know, what what are the ways that they can really double down on that old game niche? Yeah. Uh, I mean, hell, <laughs> there's loads of collectors yeah. in there. Is there anything you can, you know, you can do thinking about how a lot of those audiences are going to be game collectors? I, I mean, I don't know, yeah. but that's, I think, the way for GOG to do it. And yeah. then maybe if they're going to be able to find larger premium partners, have good reasons, like a good reason for someone to buy Cyberpunk there. At yeah. least my copy of Witcher 3 is on GOG. Yeah, which means it's DRM free. You can download it, you can yeah, put it whatever right. you want. You can just play it, no worries. The internet goes down across the globe. Doesn't matter, you've got Witcher 3, you're yeah. fine. I mean, I think you've got really good ideas there with the uh, the almost burgeoning in on limited run games and trying to do a version yeah. of them for like the PC audience as opposed to like the more console oriented stuff. Like imagine, imagine they went and got in touch with the original team behind Freelancer, and then offered a collector's edition. Uh, no, I mean, Chris Roberts is like, sort of doing Star Citizen, a bit busy. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the idea of, hey, we like Freelancer. Uh, we we know we know where these rights are. We had our legal, uh, our very overworked legal person, seemingly, if they're to keep costs down, investigate. So we figured it out. All you have to do, Chris, is sign the dotted line. We need everyone else to sign the dotted line. Difficult, yes, but... Is there a massive amount of value in there? Could you get a niche like even stuff like Mist? Could you get a copy of Could you get a copy of that really beautifully physically made? Sell that for yeah, hundred dollars, and they have the expertise to do that sort of thing within the CDP group. Yeah, so I, I think this will be a thing of how can they best serve that audience with as much business model and product innovation as is possible. Um, you know what side add-ons? Because I think it's very clear just selling games with whatever cut they have is probably not going to be enough to see the, the growth in this segment that they want. So then it's going to come down to how do we actually generate more money? How do we get up sales from people? How is it that somebody, you know, goes to buy an Ultima edition or, you know, a bunch of Ultima games? How are we going to get, you know, what, what can we offer that is, is, is more than that? Um, your idea for limited run, I, I think, is a, is a fairly interesting one. Yeah. Or a situation where maybe they want to grow some subscription revenue because there are people out there who just, you have know, the idea of, oh, cool, I can have access to loads and loads and loads and loads of classic games. All right, sweet. Yeah. Well, you have to admit the problem there with the subscription service is that they are DRM free. So and you I, sign up for yeah, one no, month okay, and download yeah, everything. Okay, well, that's messed up. Yeah, <laughs> shit. Um, I guess that's another thing. They are very much running into the... It's very pro-consumer. Yeah. They're also going to run into some uh, issues when it comes to further monetization, right? Yep, that's... Which is, yeah. It's like the un little uncomfortable thing to talk about. Yeah, I guess they, th the, the, the point is they have to find a way to really drive that pro-consumerism to their very core and start offering what people really, really want in that yeah. realm and carve out that niche. And I hope they succeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I'm, I'm down for business model innovation, so let's see where it goes. And good luck to them. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's basically it from us. So... Let us know. What do you think? Are you a GOG user? Um, do you use Galaxy as your um, as your primary launcher? Don't. Don't until it's fixed. There we go. Well, that's yeah. the answer to that. So thanks for listening. See you next time.